All good things must come to an end, right? Nothing lasts forever. While this may be the case, some things never get to be great or even really get started. In sports, this is usually because someone in power within an organization comes up with some reason to screw it all up before it even has a chance. This story follows that narrative and involves a hometown favorite and a curse that's rightly or wrongly named after them. This is what you don't know about the curse of Rocky Colavito. Welcome to What You Don't Know About Sports, where we delve into the forgotten stories, teams, and athletes of sports history, and question widely held takes on today's sports. I'm Blake, and this is Matt. Howdy. And in honor of Halloween spooky season, we're going to tell you about a curse involving one of the most beloved Cleveland sports stars of all times, and definitely uh, one of the favorites of the 1950s, that is Rocky Colavito. Uh, Before we get started, I have a question for you. Who would you rather have on a baseball team if you were in charge and had a choice? A batting champion or a home run champion? And no, you can't have both. But I can. It's one of the, in 2022, you might, but. His name is Aaron Judge. Um, (laughs) At least in the regular season. Uh, Right. I think that the right answer it's one of these things where there is no right answer. Okay. So like, like there's no way to define this because your home run champion obviously is generating runs, but if there's nobody on in front of him, he's only generating one at a time and he's only generating offense. Even if he hits 50 home runs, that's a third of your games spread out. Right. So the batting champion would not necessarily get you runs, but he would generate some kind of offense and put you in a position where you could uh, score from there. So I'm going to go with the batting champion because that's usually a guy that hits in the mid to high 300s, and that's game in, game out. Somebody's going to be on base, and then it's up to everybody else to make stuff happen. The argument argument against that is that, of course, uh, singles don't, score runs by themselves and home runs do right but uh but if you're you're probably averaging somewhere between two and three times as many singles in a season as you do home runs in a season and so you would think eventually those singles knock in a run or two or cause or put you in a position to score at some point in the game and so uh, i mean it is worth something but it's just not tallied the same yeah, unless your unless your batting champion is a guy like Tony Gwynn, who was obviously valuable, very important, but was a very much a slap hitter. I'm just going to get on base. You're probably getting a guy who is got a decent on base per, plus slugging percentage. So the guy that gets on base a lot is worth more because the only way you can score runs without hitting a home run is to get hits in bunches. So you need guys that can get on base. It's the, it's the money ball strategy. Uh, They can get on base. That's, that's the idea. Um, But yeah, I'm going to take that guy over like, who was it? Chris Davis and and Joey Gallo that can hit 50 home runs in a season. Uh, Josh Hamilton went off one year. Somebody's going to hit 190 something while they're doing it. I, no, thanks. <laughs> How many I times would the, you strike out hitting that many home runs? I've, I, me? I wouldn't well, hit like any home runs. Well, oh. No, I, me either. But <laughs> like if I, I don't know the numbers, but I wonder like uh, like this year for Aaron Judge, how many strikeouts did he have to get 62? Um, I don't think he's str- well, I don't think he struck out that many times. I don't know off the top of my head, but like it, that mean, is something that you deal with because. I mean, in theory, a uh, in theory, someone swinging for singles, swinging for swinging for hits instead of home runs, uh, they're not going to strike out as much. They're going to make contact more often because they're not swinging as hard. And so, in again, in theory, all of this is in theory because, uh, like you said, some circumstances, very few in the history of baseball, but some circumstances, you can have both. 
you just have you just get really lucky and have both like a Miguel Cabrera kind of thing or a, a very very close Aaron Judge this year. But uh, yeah, I'll take I'll take the batting champion though. Give me that. I think that's time. the I think that's that's the uh, that like that that that's the right answer. I think, but uh, plenty I bet plenty of people. Uh, I bet plenty of people would want the home run person, except for someone in this story. We'll get there in a little bit. Okay. First off, the curse itself is named after a baseball player. His name, born name, Rocco Domenico Colavito Jr. Have you ever heard anything more Italian in your life? That is the most Italian. That is incredible, right? Uh, He was born August 10th, 1933 in the Bronx, New York. To Rocco and Angelina. Uh, He was the youngest of five kids. And he loved baseball so much that after his sophomore year of high school, he dropped out of school to pursue baseball. He wanted to become a baseball player that badly. He dropped out of high school and pursued semi-pro baseball. At the time, Major League Baseball had a rule barring players from signing a pro contract prior to his high school graduating class graduating. He had obviously not graduated, and the people who were in his class before he dropped out had not graduated. Uh, So they said, no, you cannot sign a Major League Baseball contract. You cannot join the draft or anything. Uh, He appealed that and won. And so he actually signed a pro baseball contract at the age of 17. Uh, He did that by attending a tryout at Yankee Stadium uh, in the, the, what, what would this be, the 50, 1950, 1951? Uh, The Cleveland Indians, for some reason, the Cleveland Indians held a tryout at Yankee Stadium. He was one of eight or ten players to show up and try out. Uh, He immediately impressed the scouts with with his ability to throw from the outfield. Uh, Had a really, really strong arm. There was one story of throughout his career, he would stand flat footed at home plate and throw it over the uh, throw it over the wall in the out in outfield. That sounds very difficult, but I guess it's possible. (laughs) <laughs> I that's a uh, that is very much David Thompson flat footed taking a dime off the top of the backboard in that it is <laughs> somehow believable given the athlete but also highly improbable to actually have happened yeah I want to believe it it's one of those things you want to believe happened but spoilers uh, the wall was 200 feet he it was an in it was at a little league stadium okay yes. uh <laughs> But he he did impress his uh, he did impress the scouts that day with the throwing ability uh, throwing from the outfield, and so they signed him for a three thousand dollars signing bonus. Cleveland did sent him to play in the Class D Florida State League in Daytona Beach, Florida. He very very quickly rose through the minor leagues. Uh, not only could he throw, but he could hit. And who did he idolize? But Joe DiMaggio, uh, he he essentially copied his batting stance throughout his like learning how to play baseball, and so he he consistently used that throughout his youth and even coming into the semi pro world. Uh, he got bumped up to uh, Class A Eastern League. He was in Reading, Pennsylvania, and he started struggling a little bit with his hitting. And so a uh, so a, so a coach at the Reading Pennsylvania Club kind of helped him alter his stance a little bit, and it, he immediately got better results hitting. He went on that season to hit 28 home runs and 121 RBIs. This was 1953. Also, 1953 was a very important year for him. He met his future wife while he was playing in Reading Pennsylvania, uh, Carmen Perotti. They married the year later, and he met his future roommate and lifelong friend. Herb Score, who he played with for many years and remained a friend until he died. Uh, they played together in reading. They got called up to AAA, to, to AAA ball together. They played in Cleveland together for quite some time. He got called up to AAA in 54. He attended spring training with Cleveland, but apparently uh, the Cleveland outfield was a little crowded. There were something like 10 outfielders on the roster vying for three spots. And so he was sent back to AAA. Until a late season doubleheader, uh, one of the one of the outfielders, the right fielder in particular, uh, wanted a wanted a game off, or the manager gave him a day off, and so he 
uh, Colavito stepped in. He went four for four, scored two runs, and what would be considered like a like a extra, a super duper pinch hitting scenario. <laughs> Called up for AAA to play one game, and he did great. And he again impressed everyone in the in the place. Made a ridiculous throw out from the right field wall all the way to third base. It is said that the runner was 30 feet from the bag when the ball got to third base. Again. Again, we're Again. exaggerating. <laughs> Just a little bit. I can see somebody I can see somebody going going around second, going ahead and running on the new guy. I get that. Um only making it two thirds of the way then to the base. I, I'm not sure that that's true. But but is there anything is there anything more fun to watch in sports than somebody throw a ball like a far way? Like, like there are clips of, on YouTube of people just lasering balls from the outfield, no hop, just straight to their target. And they're always mesmerizing. It's like just it's like watching a dude dunk. To me, it's the same. Like You could just sit there and watch it. It's just a beautiful thing to like from the wall to third base. It's not necessarily that far, but to do it no on a hops. line, like, though. Yeah, on a line, you hit your target. That is that's impressive. Like it's just it, fun. Yeah, it it almost looks fake. Like you like everybody throws the ball it. up. Yeah, you yeah. expect it to go up. You expect it to bounce. You expect it, and then it doesn't, and it just like tricks just, your mind into like what whoa. just happened. Yeah, nuts. Like every every once in a while, you'll see a uh, every once in a while you'll see an NFL quarterback throw a ball at a weird angle, and it's I'm sure I'm sure people are people are astounded by Patrick Mahomes' arm talent at this point. <laughs> he can really spin it. <laughs> really spin it so uh but yeah it's like sometimes you get weird angles on stuff and it just looks weird well some of those throws from outfield to home plate or whatever like without bouncing there's no arc to it or sickening right well apparently he made one of these obviously impressed everyone uh and but he he kind of he got went back to triple a he was bouncing back and forth between the Indians at the time and their AAA affiliate. He got called back up in 56 and finished the season as the Indians, as one of the Indians outfielders. He played in 101 games that season. He had 89 hits in 101 games, 21 home runs and 84 RBIs. Uh, not so not quite, not a full season, but two thirds of a season ish at the time numbers. and, yeah. and uh, not terrible, right? For his first, for his really his first decent chance at a major league uh, at a major league spot for the next three seasons, he would go on to tally triple digit hits uh, tw- and he totaled 25, 41 and 42 home runs in 57, 58 and 59. He would actually go on and become an all-star in 1959. He led the American league in home runs with 42, including four home runs in one game which to that point in baseball history had only ever happened one other time in the American League by Lou Gehrig. A couple times in the National League before that, but uh, but yeah, first the second time in the American League, and I, th- I believe it has happened 18 times since. Uh, so still very rare. What is that? It's more rare than a perfect game? How many of those? 20-something? Uh, yeah, so that would be they're about the same, right at the same Almost number, the same rarity? Rare. Mm-hmm. Four... Four home runs in a game is worth <laughs> it's worth showing up for, uh, and and especially there. I mean, sometimes it's happened in five at bats or six at bats, yeah. Uh, but never, never ceases to be amazing, and it is one of those things. There are things, there are plenty of things more rare uh, than a perfect game, uh, and I think that is one of them. Yeah, it should be. If there's only eighteen, if there's only eighteen of these, I want to say the most recent perfect game was like the twenty third, twenty fourth, somewhere somewhere in the twenties. And uh, I we have not gotten to twenty, uh, we have not gotten to twenty four home run games yet, which is surprising because yeah, it's twenty three, twenty three perfect games, twenty three so, yeah. perfect games. Okay, so there's only eighteen of these, which is surprising. Uh, just because of the, uh, the, what would you call it? The, the, the wow factor around home runs now, like the, the obsession, the, whatever it is that makes 
batters want to go up there and strike well, out a thousand times in a season just to hit say, well, now, they, now they now they strike out 10 times to hit a home run so yeah it's like a 10 to 1 ratio that'd be bad yeah. that'd be really bad but yeah so very rare feat he is one of the people who have done that so now you know so it is at this point in his career where the curse allegedly comes into play so it was the off season of 1960 uh, the the Cleveland Indians had a fairly new general manager. His name was Frank Lane. Frank Lane. I hope I said that right the first time. He loved a good trade. He was actually known. Uh, he was actually known by multiple nicknames, including Trader Frank, Frantic <laughs> Frank, Trader Lane, and the Wheeler Dealer. Uh, I want to say he he made over four hundred trades in his general managing career. It just just absolutely outrageous. This this is the same guy uh, we did we did an episode on like trades uh, in our first season our first year going through this he is the guy that traded his manager for a different manager yep that's how trade happy he is he was on he was he was a member of the Cleveland Indians and traded for a manage the manager of the Detroit Tigers yeah um, which is which is really weird. Uh, because this uh, that happened about the same time that he decided to trade Rocky Colavito, who was a Cleveland fan favorite, a hometown favorite. He was not from sure. there. Colavito would later go on to say that he wanted to spend his entire career in Cleveland because he loved the town, he loved the people, uh, he loved the franchise. Uh, but he would be traded to Detroit for Harvey Quinn, who was actually the American League batting champion. From 1959. So that's where your question comes from. One for one, straight up, which is exactly what happened with the managers. Just, yeah, <laughs> just one, manager for, just other, one yeah. manager for the other. No other compensation, no players involved, no nothing. Um, so Frank Lane, uh, yeah, Frank Lane is, is quite, a, uh, quite a gambler, I would imagine, in his personal life or was. Um, but the, the way that this happened was weird. So Cleveland was playing a preseason exhibition game in Memphis. Colavito had hit a home run earlier in the game in his, in his first or second at bat. And then a little bit later on in the game, he had hit a single. He was standing on first base. Manager Joe Gordon approached him uh, during the inning, walked up to Colavito on first base, and he said, that's the last time you'll bat in a Cleveland uniform. He said, uh, I'm sorry, what? He said, you've been traded to Detroit. For Harvey Quinn, good luck. So <laughs> he immediately exited the game, um, but he did not immediately leave the facility or leave the leave the city of Memphis because uh, he had to fly back to Cleveland with Cleveland because two days after this happened, they opened their regular season against the Tigers. And okay, Detroit, yeah. the team that he just got traded to. So he had to fly back with the team that he just got traded from to go play for the team he just got traded to against the team he just got traded from. And so, and, and apparently they just, uh, Colavito and Quinn just showed up at the game and they just swapped jerseys before the game. Like Quinn wore number seven. He gave Colavito number seven. Colavito gave Quinn his number six Cleveland jersey. And it was a terrible game for both of them, by the way. I think Colavito went like 0 for 6, and Quinn went like 2 for 7. Terrible game for both. Cleveland yeah. lost that game. <laughs> but, uh, but like, that's almost like what would a, what would an equivalent of of that be in an in another sport? Like, imagine a, I'm imagining like a Premier League situation where you go in for halftime. I mean, dude was on the dude was on the field, but. I'm imagining like you go in like a, a Premier League club goes in for halftime or something or and then like they can't come back out. Like yeah. uh, <laughs> you yeah, don't let like, them finish hey, the game? Yeah, just like nah, you're done. Uh so baseball is weird in that the the whole like you got traded during the game thing happens every year. So like that part is not surprising to me it's surprising that he had no idea that he was going to be traded that is just bad management uh on the franchise's part even back in that time you should definitely communicate to people that there's an opportunity that they could <laughs> not be playing for you anymore but 
Uh, but yeah, the the baseball part uh, because that happens kind of regularly. But again, it's it's people that have some idea that there's they're being shopped or they're involved in a move. Um, rumors get around and so that they, they're they're a little bit aware and then they either sometimes they don't play the the day of the tread deadline yeah or it's a day game and they know they're not going to play but every but just about every year somebody is getting pulled in the fifth inning and it's like oh you're like watching the game and you know what's going on immediately and then it's like uh like 30 minutes an hour later it's like so-and-so's been traded here for for this but having to fly on the plane <laughs> which is cool. He gets to spend <laughs> some time with his teammates, old teammates, maybe even get to spend some time with his new teammates before, um, before the game starts. But swapping jerseys after the game has become a tradition, but before the game is a little bit odd. He had to do it before the game just to, just to get a Detroit Tigers Jersey to put on to play for his new team. But just the manner in which this was done, of course, I mean, because uh, we'll, we'll get into it. We'll get into it in a few minutes ultimately why this transpired right yes yes frank lane loves trading people and made many questionable trades in his day this is definitely one of them um but the 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 fact that he was such a fan favorite uh nine out of ten a, a radio station or a newspaper in cleveland did a poll of fans after this and nine out of ten fans were uh against the trade even so getting what? getting the batting champion, keeping the home like they were for keeping Colavito, not only for his hitting and his and his game plan stuff, but he was just very likable. Uh, the Cleveland fans liked him, even though he wasn't from there. It's not like he was a hometown person necessarily, but he was kind of a he was kind of from Cleveland at that point because he had spent his whole minor league uh, minor league time there and his whole professional time uh, there. So it's just a weird weird situation. Yeah. Uh, it's an, and, it's, and it's an unfortunate situation. And we will get to, we will get to why very shortly. But before that, we have trivia. I'm great at this game. We have trivia time. So here's Rashawn Salam. That, that is not the answer. It. That was not the answer. <laughs> You're impressed that I got it though. Um, that wasn't even the answer that the time I asked that. Anyway. It was something. Was that the answer? That was the answer. No, it was you, Rashawn you, Salam. It was, but you told it me it was the else. quarterback. You told me yeah, it was their Cordell quarterback. Stewart. You told me it was yeah. Cordero Stewart, not yeah. He was like, Impressive. did he play? Did he play quarterback? I don't think so. You said the answer is yes. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> I was confused. I was like, I wrote the question and I thought wow. I knew the answer, and here I go. You did. screwed it up, but um, but yeah. So trivia time. Uh, we mentioned a little bit ago that. Uh, four home runs in a single game has only happened 18 times in Major League Baseball history. We know who did it first, or in first in the American League at least. Um, who was the last player to do it? The most recent player to do it? <laughs> who was the most recent Major League Baseball? Not, not league-specific, Major League Baseball player. Oh, who was the mo- my God. You'll be able to figure this, you'll be able to figure this out. Who was the last player to hit four home runs in a single game in Major League Baseball? Go. What year did he do that? Was it 2017? No, I didn't think it was any. Okay, 2017. Yep. And. uh, Okay, 2017. For what team did he play for? I mean, can we jump that quick to there? The Arizona Diamondbacks. Oh. That was weird when I read it too. Right. <laughs> I've done nothing of note for over a decade, but but apparently this happened. All right, um, what position does the person play? Uh, in his career, he has played the outfield yeah. and designated hitter. So it's not Paul Goldschmidt. That's correct. He is a first baseman, That's outfielder. Correct. <clears throat> and a designated hitter. So he did it for the Diamondbacks, but he didn't play for the Diamondbacks his whole career. 2017 is actually the only year that he played for that baseball club. Okay, so what other teams has this person? At the start of his career, from the start of his career, I should say, Houston, Detroit, Arizona, and most recently and currently, this is going to be the, this is going to be the kicker. The Boston Red Sox. 
Oh, I do know this answer, and I would never have gotten it before that. Um, so this would be J.D. Martinez? J. J. D. Okay, Martinez. J.D. Martinez. I only know that because he, I, because in the show, in the in MLB The Show, you can get a card <laughs> that is J.D. Martinez as a Diamondback, and it's because of the four home run game. And I, it's not clear Ooh. that it's because of the four home run game, but now that makes sense. That now two and two card. comes together. <laughs> It's like magic. J J D Martinez Martinez. There we That's go. Him. Look, yep. I am on a roll on these things. On a roll. Sign me up. On a roll. <laughs> Just don't ask me any more hockey stuff. We figured that out. Patrick Wah. <laughs> Patrick who? Dominic Hashik. Yeah. Wayne Gretzky. Yeah, bless you. Just kidding. <laughs> I know who Wayne Gretzky is. Don't come at me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. Told you that was easy. It was very simple. That was okay, but it it really like if I didn't know, I would have had to just start listing Red Sox if I didn't know the Diamondback thing. Sotalamaki. Oh wait. That's still my favorite name. Raphael Devers. Xavier Bogarts. That's my favorite name. Xander. Well, I screwed it up. It was likes, <laughs> it was your favorite name until it, was you, it wasn't his name, name anymore. It's not, but no, Xander Bogarts is 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 better. Still and, cool. Uh, and he wears number two for Derek Jeter. So still cool. You know, yeah. Very well. Good stuff. See, told you. All right. <clears throat> so we we told you how it happened. Uh, it's very very awkward, very weird for for Rocky Colavito. Uh, the trade. If you ask people, if you ask Frank Lane at the time, and it probably to his deathbed, if you asked him, it came down to money. Mm. Uh, Rocky wanted a raise. In 1959, he had only made $28,000. And based on uh, becoming an all-star, leading the American League in home runs, all the great things that he did, he wanted a raise. Who blames him besides Frank Lane? He wanted $45,000. Uh, of course, that would almost double his salary, and that was probably far too much. Frank Lane was quoted at the time as saying, Rocky hit only 257. He hit 303 the year before. I'm not even sure he deserved a raise. So his batting average fell s- fairly significantly from a 303 to 257, and he increased uh, his home run total in 1959 by one over 1958. So uh, Harvey Quinn, on the other hand, he signed with Detroit. Uh, He made 35,000 in 1959. He wanted 50 and Detroit gave him 42. So he also wanted a raise, was unhappy. Uh, Both Quinn and Colavito had a very brief holdout during these contract negotiations in spring training. No, everyone played for the love of the jersey and never did anything like that yeah. back in the day. Kids these days, right? Oh, God. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, they both had holdouts. Uh, they both wanted more money. Uh, both franchises kind of lowballed them. And this was a time before players had agents. And likely a big reason why they started using them. <laughs> because uh, these negotiations were sickening at some times. Um, the Detroit Free Press's headline after this uh, after this gargantuan trade was 42 home runs for 135 singles. They were happy. They were happy oh, they yeah. got the home run king and was giving up somebody who hit like 353 or 383 the season before, like which is weird, uh, as we've already discussed. Um, singles, uh, well, maybe not. In, uh, definitely, I would have thought in 1960. Uh, the batting champion would have been more valuable, but Detroit was happy for some reason. Um, the uh, An author, uh, writer for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Hal Lebowitz, wrote at the time, quote, last time I checked, a single doesn't count as much as a home run. It's definitely true. I mean, it, it, and, and home runs are more attractive, and it's always the thing that has been romanced about baseball. I, I, 
a guy that hits 42 home runs with a 250 batting average is not the end of the world. A guy that hits 41 with a 300 batting average like he did the year Ooh. before is impressive. Uh, and so uh, may, that would be what I would be excited about is maybe maybe he can still hit 30 or 40, but get hit closer to 300. I I don't know. A guy that hits high 300s is valuable. I don't. Very. I, don't I could see why you would sell the trade. I'm not sure why you would sell that you necessarily either side, why either side would sell that they won the trade. Yeah. They were both in the same situation. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, and then, so that's the weird part to me is like, you're giving up, like you're, you're giving up one player for a very, a player in a very similar situation. Yeah. The, so yeah, the only that way that trade, only way that trade works is if, is if, Detroit has uh, other guys that get on base regularly but had no power. Then you're yeah. getting some power to complement that. And then Cleveland had a couple of other guys that could pop off at that time, 20 or 30 home runs. But we're lacking regular attendance on the base paths. And so then it would work as a trade for both sides. Otherwise, you're just you are just trading. I would be willing to bet if you looked at war. I know that's an advanced stat and everybody hates uh analytics, but I'd bet if you looked at war for those seasons before they were traded, they're probably close. And so, like, what's the point of this trade? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would... I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, I will say that uh at the at, um during Colavito's time in Cleveland, they did not win a pennant. They did like they didn't. They weren't. Uh, they weren't a. I mean, they were. They were a winning ball club, but they weren't champions of any sort. Uh, they. They've only Cleveland's only won two World Series titles in its history, and the most recent one to this day was in 1948. And so, right. which is part of the curse. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, I have some uh, some fun numbers about Frank Lane. Uh, this 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 is according to uh, an author who wrote the book in the early 90s, The Curse of Rocky Colavito, where the curse originated. Terry Pluto. He's he writes in his book that Frank Lane was making 60,000 a year salary and would make an extra five cents for every fan in attendance for their games over 800,000 for the regular season. In 1959, Lane's attendance bonus was worth over $34,000. After the trade in 1960, Lane's bonus dropped to around $7,500, which means Frank Lane paid Quinn 42 grand, more than Colavito would have made at 35 grand. And his personal attendance bonus that's added onto his salary dropped by more than $27,000. So he paid money to lose money for all intents right. and purposes. And they so still didn't win. Completely money driven. Yeah, completely they, money driven yeah. there. And they still didn't win anything, it, which is which is the weirdest part. And and we mentioned before that uh, in the season opener, chan- uh, the, the fans – in the opening day game in 1960 uh, with Cleveland versus Detroit, they cheered for Colavito and made signs talking bad about Frank Lane because they hated the trade so much. And Frank Lane was a fairly new general manager at this time. And I want to say off the top of my head, I want to say Frank Lane went uh, and, and like moved on to another team fairly, very soon after this. So he comes in and it like is. rips this franchise apart and then like, Signs away their other their uh, their favorite player. I want to say Harvey Quinn lasted this season. Maybe he didn't last very long in Cleveland either. After this, and so they acquired oh, yeah. this dude who was not what they thought he was. I don't know. It was very weird. Very very weird. So so I've looked up the advanced stats for that year before they were traded. Um, so Calavito had a five point four WAR. War? Why did I just call war. it war? Ooh. Five point four war, 
uh, which is solid all-star status. Uh, Quinn's was the year before the trade 4.3, which is also borderline all-star. He was an all-star. So uh, Quinn was worth 44 runs over the average player. And Calavito was worth 53 runs over the average player. So it really was a nuts and bolts. It was, it was tit for tat on the trade. Minus the fact that apparently Cleveland was going to save a buttload of money on it, which is good value, I guess, but not <laughs> yeah. the right thing. I, yeah. It's almost like, uh, it's almost like you like at some point when well I mean he had only been Colavito had only been on the the Cleveland Indians roster for uh, three full seasons, three or four full seasons, and so like it's not like a Kobe Bryant situation or a Derek Jeter situation where you've brought this down in city championships and like you're expecting the hometown yeah. discount and. At some point, you at some point, in my opinion, players sh- should earn that. They should receive that if if what they've done is is worth it. And I don't think that's hard to determine uh, whether whether a player has brought enough to a town or a city to a franchise to make that hometown discount type of thing. Uh, uh, or like you're just you're worth uh, you're worth X amount of money, or you're worth an extension, even though you're well past your prime kind of thing, but we're going to, we're going to sign you and keep you anyway, just to keep it going, you know? Right. Um, I don't know that like Colavito just wasn't there that long. And so I get the, I get the fans, uh, I get the fans wanting him to stay uh, because he was the home run. He was the reigning home run King and they just shipped him off. Uh, So that's weird. But the, the, the weirder part is the fact that this curse is named after him. Like he's not the one that that like ruined the franchise. He's not the one that screwed them for years to come. It should be the curse of Frank Lane, shouldn't it? Right. It's not the Bobby Lane. It's not the Bobby Lane situation where allegedly he was like, "You're never gonna win," and this is not that. Yeah. No, he never. Yeah. Apparently, uh, allegedly, and, and no one has ever claimed that Colavito has ever said anything like this because he still liked Cleveland. As a matter of fact, he was traded back to Cleveland in 1965 and spent additional time there, and so he never like. He never uh, quote unquote cursed the franchise. Uh, it, I think that I think the curse is uh, is misnamed um, at a minimum, if there's even a right. curse. Um, but after 1960, of course, you can probably guess what comes next. A lot of losing. Lots and lots of losing. Cleveland went 34 seasons from 1960 to 1993 without without finishing within 11 games of first place. Oh, yeah, there's. There's a Oof. reason. There's a reason the movie Major League chose the Cleveland Indians <laughs> to be to be the team that was going to get moved to Miami by losing. They were just bad forever. Real bad. Real bad. Real bad. They and did played win. In, played in a giant stadium that nobody wanted to go to, like eighty thousand seats for losing. Couldn't fill it to save their life. Uh, uh, they did. They did win three American League pennants. Since 1960 to this day, uh, 95, 97, and 2016, uh, but of course no World Series trophies, and they did somehow go on a 22 game winning streak in 2017, which is the longest in American League history and the second longest in baseball history. And but they didn't win the pennant that year. Uh, they obviously didn't. I mean, th- I think they got a, uh, I think they got a wild card or something, <laughs> and they f- and they flaked out. And so and, and not to mention. Uh, how your struggling New York Yankees in this year's postseason somehow got somehow knocked the Guardians out of the playoffs? I'm still not sure how that happened. I would love to say that it's it's tradition, but honestly, it's not. That's that's the Twins and the Rangers. Uh, they always lose to the Yankees. The the Indians usually tip for tat. That 2016 C team beat the Yankees in the playoffs. The '97 champions beat the Yankees. Uh, as well in the division series. That's the one year in the late nineties, the Yankees did not win the world series. Um, so the Indians actually have pretty good uh, track record against the Yankees, but not this year because the Indians can't win. Uh, the guardians can't win anything. 
It was funny, uh, side note, watching watching the playoff games and like you see the lineups of the Guardians and all their hitters are like 250, 265, 270, 260, 280, two, like all across the board from like one to nine. And then the Yankees lineup is like Aaron Judge, number one, two million, whatever he had, whatever he hit. And then everyone behind him is like 200, 210, 180. Oh, it's like yeah. it was embarrassing. I was like, oh, they fell off. They are they are built by computer nerds <laughs> who think who think that they money they, the Yankees money balled themselves. I I don't know what kind of ball it is. Dumb is what it is. <laughs> uh, They're about to get swept like, as of this recording. But anyway, it's it's gonna get it's gonna get better. The the Guardians. Um, the thing that this team now has in common with those 90s teams, though, is that they've always been good when they have a bunch of young players that just kind of pop up together. Um, that was their deal in the 90s uh, with Kenny Lofton and Omar Vizcayel and Jim Tomey and all those dudes being uh, 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 in the minor leagues together and popping up and then popping off, but never winning because it's Cleveland and only if LeBron, only if LeBron makes it happen can Cleveland. The city of Cleveland. This is for you. <laughs> but I can, the believe, only way to... I can believe this is cursed, though, because like Rocky Calavito gets traded and you never win again. If you keep Riley Ca- Rocky Calavito, maybe that doesn't happen. You had to get him back. So you lost something in bringing him back to Cleveland. Um, yeah, I don't never trade your best player. Should be a that's the moral. That's the moral because Cleveland terrible. So you believe this is a curse? You be, you believe the franchise is cursed based on this? Based on this trade? Because lots it of weird is. stuff happened after 1960. After this trade, a lot of weird stuff, a lot of misfortunes yeah. happened to the franchise after this. It is. It is just like Buffalo and just like the, the Lions. It when you get to a certain point of nothing works and nothing happens right because baseball is a sport that is random at times like the randomness of it is what is fun about it and you can't win in now going on 60 years come on Mm -hmm. like something's got to be wrong at that point it's got to be a curse you can't be inept for 60 years (laughs) Like the people that were in up uh, sixty years ago are dead. Like, <laughs> like at some point, somebody's got to hit on something. Somebody's got to show up and and do something. You would yeah. think, yeah, you you would think so, but I I don't know. I mean, like they've they've won multiple AL Central titles recently, uh, including mm-hmm. this, including t- the twenty twenty two season. Uh, Terry Francona is a is a World Series winning winning manager and so it's not it's not like yeah to your demise it's not like it's not like they're a bad team but like something's got to give don't you think yeah i'm gotta, sure I'm, gotta allow it. I'm sure there's plenty of strange things that have happened to prove that to prove the curse yeah okay so uh then i have a game for us if you want to play a game I because game. i won the last game because i have a list of things so not maybe not everything but some of the many of the misfortunes also uh also from terry pluto's book uh of things misfortunes as he calls them that struck the cleveland franchise uh, since this trade and i want you to tell me as i read, go through each one may not read all of them as i go through the as i read them i want you to tell me whether it's cursed or not okay so it's something that would happen if you were yeah. cursed or something, if it's like, if it's, happen. yeah, if it's just like, oh, that's just an unfortunate baseball event that happens to everybody, or there's a ghost in the clubhouse, like stabbing players in the back or something, some weird. Great. I'm an NC State fan. I am well You're, versed in what is. I was about to say you are well versed in Let's in stuff. <laughs> yeah, stuff. That's All right. right so first one is the fact that they got Colavito back. In 1965, but they sent Tommy John and Tommy Ang- a- Aggie, 
to uh, to the Chicago White Sox. And at the time, Tommy John had only won two games in the major leagues, but of course he would go on to win 280 something after that. <laughs> Uh, he would he would play for teams that reached the World Series. Uh, and so, is that is that something that is that that's something that a curse caused, or is that just misfortune? That is that is just misfortune. That is just bad. That's bad management because you made the one yeah. bad decision trading Calavito. Now to get him back, you've got to lose assets that you shouldn't have. Uh, so that's just mismanagement. Uh, so that part not cursed. Okay, not cursed. Number two, not cursed. Uh, the Cleveland Gar- uh, Guardians. I'm going to call them the Guardians. Uh, <laughs> no matter when it happened, uh, they traded pitcher Jim Mudcat Grant away in 1964. They received Lee Strange and George Banks in return. Uh, Grant at the time had only won 67 career games. He would go on to win uh, 78 more after the trade, even though he was 28 years old. He won 21 games in 1965, and he helped the Twins win their first pennant. Curse that or misfortune? Is, that is... That's misfortune. That's not a curse. That's misfortune. That's, again, management yeah, issues. We're going to label that misfortune. Yeah, you just gave up on a guy too early. Misfortune. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sam McDowell, a pitcher of the franchise at one point, uh, he, he began suffering from alcoholism and he, be- he went from being one of the game's best picture pitchers in 1960 in the 1960s to a completely unreliable one. And he ended up leaving baseball at the age of 32. He would, uh, by all good graces would stop drinking and he would become a counselor to athletes with drinking problems. Now, before you answer, playing for the Cleveland Indians at in the '60s, after all this is going on, uh, uh, not not that we are uh, not that we're promoting uh, drinking, but tough times, tough times. So, would would the alcoholism of one of your uh, of one of you, one of the franchise's best pitchers be curse or misfortune? That is. See, all these things together sound cursed, but by themselves, <laughs> you can't help that the franchise is located in Cleveland. So uh, that is just an un- that's misfortune. Okay, we're, we're each of these individually is, but I think so it, I far think the- as, as we keep going, though. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're mounting <laughs> evidence of a curse, but right now, misfortune. Okay, um, first baseman Tony Horton suffered from. Uh, severe stress uh, and mental illness from playing in the major leagues, and he ended up leaving the game, leaving baseball in the middle of the 1970 season. He was only 25 years old. He would receive treatment and recover, but he would never return to baseball. The stress of playing in the major leagues got rid of your first baseman in the middle of the season. Curse or misfortune? Two two people having uh, debilitating mental health issues is definitely starting to look like a curse. That definitely weird. Independently would look mis- like mis- mis- missing fortune. That's not the word. Mis- misfortune. <laughs> uh, but but two in a decade seems like more than your fair share. So that belongs. A little weird. We're starting to look like curse now. Okay. I'm uh, living the I'm living vicariously through the people of Cleveland. I can only imagine <laughs> what Reddit posts would look like about this happening and how could it be happening again? So I think we're getting, we should, should we join the, should we try and join the guardian subreddit and, and like see what's going on? What y'all feel about (laughs) you? It looked like it it would look a lot like the NC state subreddit. I'm sure. Uh, The commander subreddit for sure. Oh, definitely that too. Uh, Steve Dunning, uh, the pitcher, he was Mm -hmm. the second overall pick in the 1970 draft. Uh, He was brought straight to the major leagues from Stanford Never pitched in the minors. Uh, allegedly, he quit baseball in 1977, but it was because he called. He was called up too soon. He had a career record of 23 and 41, and he he quit baseball at the age of 28 at like the supposed prime of his career. He was struggled really bad. Curse or misfortune? Misfortune. That's mismanagement again. More mismanagement. 
Stop bringing dudes. That that wasn't the only one. There's been a couple of dudes in that time period that spent very little or almost no time in the minor leagues, and it screwed them all up. Don't don't yeah. do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got to think at some point all this mismanagement is caused by something. Maybe something supernatural. Is if you know what I'm smart saying. Smart people go to <laughs> fail. Apparently. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> um, Wayne Garland, he was signed in 1976, a uh, 25-year-old right-handed pitcher. He was signed from the Orioles. Uh, he won 20 games, lost only seven. Uh, he was a free agent after that year, and the Indians offered him a contract worth $2.3 million over 10 years. He hurt his shoulder in his first spring training with the Indians, chose to pitch through the pain rather than have immediate surgery, he went 13 and 19 in 1977. He retired three years later at the age of 30 with a career record of 55 and 66, playing through a shoulder injury, curse or misfortune. Franchise player, star player, getting uh, getting brought in, and and probably all kinds of articles written about him and how he's going to save everything, and then being hurt. Uh, definitely is something I have experience with in my fandom, and that is curse. <laughs> we have reached the point where it is officially a curse, or at least that that's happens. Curse. No, that's curse. That is curse things. This is the way curses work. Tell you 100%. That is not misfortune. <laughs> that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen to places that aren't cursed. Mm. The Lakers, the Lakers aren't signing somebody. Um, maybe Anthony Davis, I guess, but they still got a championship out of it. Like the Lakers are upside at the people that that just fall apart immediately. Curse, Curse. Mm. like immediately upon arrival, just collapse. Yep, yep. As soon as you get there, everything falls apart. That's that's how curses look. Keep going. <laughs> I love this. Nineteen eighty four. They traded. Uh, they traded their pitcher, one of their pitchers, Rick Sutcliffe. To the Chicago oh. Cubs, along with outfielders Joel Carter and Mel Hall and two others. Uh, Sutcliffe would go on and help the Cubs win the NL East mm-hmm. title that year, won the Cy Young, won it again in 1989. He won 35 games in over in just over two seasons with the Indians. But then he won 114 more after they got rid of him. <laughs> Mel Hall was a bit of a disappointment, apparently. Uh but he, but uh, Joe Carter would become one of baseball's top sluggers with the Indians. Uh, Carter would be traded to San Diego in 1989 for a catcher and a second baseman. Uh, possibly, uh, <laughs> possibly the best trade in Indians' recent history. Apparently, allegedly, <laughs> according to uh, Terry Bluto, um, Alomar and Berga mm. would be major pi- major pillars in the team's success in the 90s. Um, but would in, they did trade away one of their best pitchers who would go on and uh, who would go on and win with another team and win Cy Young Awards for, uh, the two following years. So, trade, again, mismanaging, maybe trading away your best people, curse or misfortune? So, this one, this one I don't think falls under any... It's neither because they get because this is actually a thing that leads to breaking the curse because they do get Sandy Alomar and Carlos Baerga, who are very important for those, like you said, for those 90s teams. Also, Joe Carter ends up getting traded with Roberto Alomar to the Blue Jays, where he hits the famous home run to win the World Series. Roberto Alomar eventually... uh, also is a part of those 90s Cleveland teams. So they got both Alomar brothers kind of indirectly uh, through Joe Carter. So I think I think that actually not curse. They did win a bunch of AL Central titles, uh, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2001. So they won, yes. what, five out of six out of seven? Is that right? And I think, yeah, six I out think of seven? Sold, out, sold out the stadium for like, 10 years in a row or something a million, crazy while they were doing a million that. Games great, something like that. But no World Series titles. Right. So they had all this talent and something something stopped them from winning. Anyway, uh, apparently, uh, following the 84 win season of 1986, Sports Illustrated uh, put Indian Uprising 
Man, that sounds terrible. They put Indian Uprising in 1987 in the baseball preview issue of Sports Illustrated and no, showed Carter, Corey Snyder. Uh, yeah, hold on. The sub the sub headline said, "Believe it, Cleveland is the best team in the American League." They would actually go on to lose 101 games that year and finish with the worst record in Major League Baseball. What now, year was that? This is 1987. I know oh what you're going to say. It's it's not this curse. It's another curse. But is it curse? Is it the curse of Rocky Colavito or just misfortune? They got double curse there. You can't. <laughs> you don't want to be on Sports Illustrated's cover. And now it doesn't matter because it's not really Sports Illustrated anymore. But... You don't want to be on Sports Illustrated cover. Like if I was ever that a was famous, tough. if somebody ever called me or my a family member or a friend, were like, "We want you to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated," it's like, no, Negative. tell everybody they wanted you to be on the cover, but do not, under any circumstances, appear <laughs> on the front of that magazine. Nothing good ever came of it. It's you want like to be the, the cover athlete like of Madden? Madden. No, you don't. N- no, nothing. Do you like your ACLs? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so so curse, but not this one. Sports yeah. Illustrated cover well, double, curse. That's double curse. Double oh, curse. so it's both. Yeah, mm, double. Okay. Last one. 1993, there was a spring training boating accident that, that killed two relief pitchers, uh, Steve Olin and Tim Cruz, and nearly killed Bob Ojeda. That's another starting pitcher. Uh, so that essentially wiped out three of their pitchers in in one tragic accident, and uh, one of another one of their relievers, Kevin Wickender, was so grief stricken by the by the incident, uh, he was traded mid season, and never was never as good as he once was. Never regained his effectiveness. So they essentially lost four pitchers in one boating accident during spring training in 1993 now i mean that's that's tough but it's terrible yeah terrible that's that, really uh, bad well, we're not gonna rank that because this is just terrible yeah, yeah. But, that's I mean, that you know, that does that is in the list that is in the list of of misfortunes that occurred to the franchise uh uh terry pluto has written two books since uh this this original one uh and he insists that the curse is still in place um, but again, Colavito denies ever placing one on the franchise. He did come back and play for them at some point. Uh, there is one other weird thing just to like kind of tie it all together. Right. So, uh, the, the, the exhibition game in the spring of 1960, it was played mm-hmm. in Memphis, mm-hmm. uh, in, in a, in a stadium called Russwood park that was primarily constructed of wood. Four hours after that game ended, the park was destroyed in a five alarm fire and was never played in again. Curse or misfortune? <laughs> okay. That's weird. So directly after this, okay, during the game, Rocky Calavito was told this is your last at bat, right? Like he was told he was traded during the game. During the game. And then after the game, stadium burned down. Stadium Clearly, burned down. Not in Cleveland. Not right, and not in like an opposing city. It was in Memphis, so it was. So the day, but the day they traded him, four the hours after the game, stadium burned down. That is quite literally the definition of of a curse. You should have led with that. Uh, yes, the whole thing is cursed, <laughs> beginning to end. Now we know they need they need to go to Memphis and they need to donate money to rebuild, to to renovate, to do something to. Uh, whatever stadium is there now, they need to make Memphis their Triple A team. They need to do something, give all the good to graces make this, to make this right. And I think they're going to find out it's not the curse of Rocky Calavito; it's the curse of Memphis. They need to go to Bill Street. They got to do something. <laughs> go visit Graceland. Make this correct. Do something. And uh, and uh, yeah, and then they're going to work out. That's definitely the weirdest one to me. And so I had to, I had to save it for last. But uh, yeah, I think we found the solution. Yeah. So that was weird. So yeah, uh, they they might need to become the Memphis Guardians at some point and uh, and give Memphis everything they stole from them. And so, uh, but yeah. So uh, final thoughts. I th- my final thought is that it should just be the curse of Frank Lane. I think I think he's the one that screwed it all up. 
Yeah, clear. I mean, the dude, the dude was unhinged. Uh, he is the kind of person that would just change the color of his house every week because why not? Uh, he just wanted to trade things, play fantasy sports before they were a thing. But for real people. But for real people, yeah. I <laughs> we have friends. We have friends that would would thrive as Frank Lane uh, with their fantasy lineups. Anyway, um, I I don't. Just knowing the the fact that he was he was fine with trading everybody, it's something he would do, and it's definitely his fault. Like it, it, you have, it's anything that is that is unbecoming because of that trade is his fault because he's the one that made it, not for uh, not Calavito for for cursing it. And um, you know, I don't think that you can in in pro sports. I don't think you could do something that that hurts a franchise for 60 years unless you're the owner dan snyder but uh and he's not even made it that long so 60 years is hard to do 20 years is hard to do unless you're the owner dan snyder um yeah i but it's got to be something like when you look at these places that never win anything, the franchises that cannot get out of their own way, there's got to, there's something more. It's not just culture. It's not just whatever. There's, there's, it is, it is statistically impossible. The Supernatural. Cleveland have existed as long as the Cleveland guardians now have existed as long. Maybe they just needed to change the name. That could have been it. Maybe it was a curse that we don't know about. Uh, mm. But it is statistically impossible that that franchise has existed as long as it has without winning. Uh, it's tough. I mean, at least they're, they're, they've won pennants recently. They they have not they have not eclipsed the mountain yet. But they've um, got yeah, banners, but they're not the one that matters. Yeah, but and their and their core is is fairly young, I believe. Uh, their current one is fairly young and fairly good. Uh, so I mean, I, it could be it could only be a matter of time before before the curse is broken. So, uh, well, uh, if, if you, uh, if you have any more idea, we love these curses. We love like spooky stuff. We'll cover spooky stuff and curses and weird things all year. But in honor of Halloween, uh, we wanted, we wanted to tell you this one. Uh, and in honor of, uh, the guardians just very recently, as of this recording, getting knocked out of the major league baseball playoffs. So, uh, it was very timely also, but, uh, shoot us any ideas, uh, follow us on social media, uh, like subscribe all of that stuff and and that's what you don't know about the curse of frank lane because that's what we've renamed it uh, until then till next time see y'all bye Thank you for listening to this episode of What You Don't Know About Sports. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please leave us a review, five stars only, and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. If you have a great sports story, we want to hear about it. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WYDKAS Podcast, and on our YouTube channel at What You Don't Know About Sports Podcast. All episodes are written, recorded, and edited by us. Stay tuned for the next episode.